So we will begin. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Roads and Transportation Society's talk today. Uh, we have a very exciting talk booked in on low traffic neighbourhoods. And joining us today to give, give the presentation is Paul Tucker from Atkins Realist and John Little. Paul is a project manager and a director with with Atkins Realis and has been working on this scheme quite intrinsically. He's a project manager with 15 years of active travel delivery in London. And Paul will talk through the, the design and delivery of the active travel schemes, including segregated cycleways, low traffic neighborhoods, and the rapid rollout schemes that were rolled out during COVID-19. We also have John Little with us today. John is a director of Bespoke and a founder of Beat the Streets. So without further ado, I will hand over to both Paul and John for further introductions and to take us through the presentation. Thank you very much, Brendan. Uh, exciting presentation, no pressure there. So uh, let's, uh, without further ado, let's get started. So thank you very much for having us today. Uh, very pleased to be here to talk about active travel uh, in London. Um, a bit about me first. Uh, yeah, so as Brian said in the introduction there, I, I'm, I'm a project man manager by trade. Uh, I spent uh, all of my career to date working at Transport for London. Um, I joined in 2004 and I left in 2023. Uh, and from those 18 years, I spent about 15 of them working on active travel. Um, I fell into active travel in the first place. It wasn't a conscious decision, um, but I applied for a job working on uh, the cycle hire scheme that was um, uh, in design around and I was successful getting the job as an assistant project manager. Uh, and, and from there, that was the the, uh, the beginning of my story with active travel. So uh, I've worked on various schemes that, that TFL has had in, in the portfolio at that time. Uh, three phases of cycle hire. Uh, I did the segregated cycle super highways. Uh, I've done, done two or three phases of that. Um, and I was at TfL for the COVID nineteen response schemes, which, given uh, given the, our government's directive to to walk and cycle, uh, meant meant plenty of work for me. Uh, in, in between, I've also done a little bit of work on Tour de France uh, and Tour of Britain when they've been been in London, uh, and that's really cemented my, uh, well, I guess, all of those schemes have cemented my interest in in active travel and uh, and, and particularly in cycling. Uh, John, I can talk about you, but but perhaps you want to do the slide for this one. Uh, yeah, hello everyone. Um, it's quite a youthful looking me in that photo. But anyway, um, hi, yeah, I'm I'm John Little. Um, I work in kind of active travel, uh, community engagement kind of uh, area, but I suppose I also um, help local authorities, A, secure funding for big projects um, and big big change where possible, um, and also can kind of then help them through that organisational change and, and stuff that's sometimes needed. And as I was saying earlier, actually, there's a real tends to be a real focus on the outside and what we're going to change on the street and um, how people might react to that. But actually, in order to do things properly, we need to think about how organisations that are implementing those sort of schemes go through change too. Um, list there are kind of some of the projects I've, I've been involved in. Um, started actually in parking and, and I'm an environmental scientist by education, but um, but I kind of believe that actually parking controls are the most powerful sustainable transport tool there is. That's a pub conversation for another time. But um, I worked on Emirates Stadium, basically stopping people driving there and, and providing alternative modes. Um, met Paul working on cycle hires, um, led the design team, the first 650 docking stations on that. Worked on 17 of the 22 Olympic venues. Worked in Lambeth and various other local authorities, actually, with a sort of consultancy uh, hat on. And then um, helped Bob and Forrest with their Mini Holland programme, which is what I'm going to mainly talk about later. I have uh, my own consultancy called Bespoke. Um, and more recently, in lockdown, just to make my life even more complicated, I decided to uh, launch some street design software called Beat Streets with a uh, my business partner Andy. Um, and yeah, that's enough from me, probably for now. Cool. thank you, John. Uh, so let's. Um, I guess just just for, just for the kind of some of those schemes and 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 the journey for um, for for active travel in London. Um, and it really kicked off in in the two thousands. Um, we'd, we'd obviously had you know people walk and cycle before that as, 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 I'm, as I'm sure you'll be aware but but really it was um it was cycle high that I think kick-started the the, the the kind of the cycling boom in London so um 
I started working on the scheme in about 2008, but it was already, it was already in feasibility prior to that. And then essentially we launched in 2010 with 10 London boroughs. Uh, I guess technically might be nine plus City of London, but yeah, um, all the central boroughs within London were, were involved. Um, and what we had to do was, as per the image on the left, there is we, you know, we had to um, get a network of, of docking stations across London that, um, you know, allowed allowed for people to cycle to cycle to and from their destinations. Um, the, I guess the other backdrop to this is, is politics within London. So uh, yeah, all those London boroughs have have different political opinions and, and different councillors and their own governance structures and things. And, and, and we uh, everyone had to come together with with TFL as the leader, if you, if, if you like, on, on on behalf of the, uh, uh, the 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 mayor for London and his and his transport team to to, uh, to deliver this scheme. Um, as I say, with, with TFL at the lead. And there's the, and there's the mayor at the time when the scheme launched, Boris Johnson, um, who uh, for for his many wrongs uh, uh, cycling was one thing he was quite passionate about which which um uh, uh, certainly worked out in in london's um favor as, you, as you'll see through the th uh, through the following slides cycle super highways was next um so the initial rollout of cycle super highways um uh, was reallocating road space away from traffic specifically for cyclists so tfl looked at 12 arterial routes uh, to and from london with the route numbers reflecting a clock face uh, and effectively uh, or uh, essentially, um, as you can see from the image on the right, there was there was blue paint and and a, and a wider than usual cycle lane uh, to allow people to cycle into um, in into London. Um, and you'll see from later slides how uh, how that's well done and how it's been um, adapted since. In conjunction with the super highways rollout, uh, TfL also launched quiet ways, uh, which essentially was back streets. Um, supposed there were supposed to be quieter streets or traffic street streets traffic free streets but essentially they were connections between the between the super highways and and links in the network to encourage people to cycle yeah on on quieter streets on on back streets to and from their destination um it could be argued how successful these were um some some of the interventions as per the image on the left were you know where we're filtering traffic made for uh, made for all quiet ways but other ones were essentially you were taking back streets that you shared with traffic um you could argue that the level to which these were we, these were cycling interventions and sandwiched in the middle of the super highways and uh the quiet ways was the launch of low traffic neighborhoods um and john uh this is where i'm gonna gonna hand over to you because this is your area of expertise rather than mine uh, thanks paul i will um yeah, hopefully that's, that sets things nicely, but I, I guess it's worth pointing out that from a tra Transport for London perspective where I was, Transport for London have their own road network within London, um, or which is uh, informally called the Red Route, uh, and all the borough roads will be uh, on the Yellow Route, um, which is uh, in, indicates local roads. So the very nature of TfL means that we don't have many many local roads. We were um, uh, in charge of delivering schemes on the, on the bigger roads. Uh, we were able to target the roads we wanted to choose um, from TfL's road network, where typically you had wider roads. That meant there was more road space for reallocation, um, uh, which always works in our favour, you know, just, just despite the need to uh, potentially impact on traffic uh, traffic flows when, when, when taking that space away. So uh, traffic neighbours was, was a borough thing. And as you mentioned, John, you've got plenty of experience with the boroughs. Yeah, cool. Um, thank you, Paul. Um, Right, so as it says there from, from Lambeth, Forth and Forest and back again, I will all be explained in a moment. Um, basically, I, I, I was working in, in Lambeth um, after the cycle hire um, and started to get involved in, in some interesting projects there. Um, Lambeth, as I'm sure some of you may know, is a pretty central London borough. It's quite a diverse place. Um, it kind of it changes quite dramatically, actually, as, as you travel down through the borough, it gets hillier um, and changes significantly. But certainly the north of the borough has always been very much a part of central London. Um, and I'm going to kind of focus on a few things talking about Lambeth and Welcome Forest. Basically, what happens when you start asking people out streets, um, the implementation of a borough wide cycling walking program, the rise of the liberal neighbourhood, walking cycling, London's transport response to COVID-19 and a brave new world just to uh, not use 1984, which is obviously always normally the... Uh, the uh, book reference for so um, Lambeth Neighbourhood Enhancement Programme, basically where it sort of began for me in in turn, not necessarily where where I thought um, we should start looking at changing streets, but certainly about being able to do something about it in in a significant way in a, in a local authority. It's a programme called the Neighbourhood Enhancement Programme. It was very much um, engagement led. The idea being that we asked people actually what they kind of wanted. Um, that was kind of rooted in the fact that Lambeth was a cooperative council, which meant it's very much about resident-led decision-making, um, a focus on community engagement, 
open approach to data and stuff and not keeping secrets and hiding speed data behind your back while you're talking to people, that kind of stuff. Um, and it was basically a first step in engaging the community in issue identification, which was quite important. Um, we used basically a postcard just to send out and ask people what they liked and what they didn't like about their streets and, and the places they lived in. We then went out through lots of uh, different community networks, outreach workers, resident groups, anything but your standard kind of consultation document through the door, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but we still sent out maps and, and, and packages through three doors effectively once we'd started getting people involved in that process but that was more about informing them of the history of the area and the project itself um and and kind of the scope and what we could start doing so as i said co-design and community involvement was kind of a real continual theme theme throughout those projects um it was a positive engagement to prioritize issues and opportunities it wasn't necessarily um yes no's it wasn't a referendum certainly we're, we're no good at those as i'm sure you know in this country um, but basically, it was kind of an area based light touch scheme. But what was interesting was that that when you started asking people what their issues and, and opportunities were, of course, they were what we think they are everywhere in, in urban areas, certainly too much traffic, not enough space for people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we prioritised the most popular schemes, went forward with those, as I say, rather than yes, knowing it. Um, basically larger schemes that were out of scope were priced into what was called the project bank and, and they're now actually being picked off still kind of 10 years later um, but obviously with an idea that people actually want change in, in those specific areas. Um, issues outside of the scope are handed over to the right departments and resident involvement uh, was central to the project delivery. What was really important with Lambeth though as we said was that whilst everybody was saying too much traffic too much rat running and the obvious answer from us as transport professionals was to close streets and filter streets political uh fear I would suggest at the time probably meant that we didn't go with that we did everything but we made things look nice we made we you know we 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 produced maps we did all kinds of stuff but not really what you really needed to do at the same time, uh, Waltham Forest got in touch with me via the consultancy I was working with at the time and asked me to get involved in helping them draft their Mini Holland bid. Um, basically, the Mini Holland programme was part of the former Mayor's Transport Strategy. It was open to all outer London boroughs, again, primarily because inner London tends to be a focus for the spending. Um, and the scope of the bid, as it says on the slide there, was to basically introduce a world-class community cycling route, a main town centre scheme, which is mainly actually supposed to be a public realm kind of grandiose scheme, linking your secondary town centres with a cycle network and then some supporting measures. Um, what became really clear actually in Waltham Forest was that the, the grandiose kind of public realm scheme wasn't necessarily needed at the time. Uh, Waltham Forest is one of the outer London boroughs in the northeast there, a uh, population probably actually nearer 300,000 now I'd imagine the amount of development that's going on. A young borough growing with lots of development in the region, as I said, and therefore lots of opportunities for development and developers to work with the council to make the place better. Um, it was a host borough, for the London 2012 Olympics, and a very diverse place with a very rapidly kind of changing population and, and people moving in and out of the borough um, pretty regularly. It, all that meant there were some real opportunities, but also some real issues. Why Waltham Forest? Well, it's a very car dependent place. It wasn't certainly at the time. Um, it gave a real opportunity to make significant changes. As I say, I think quite often, our, you know, with budgets and everything else, we tend to kind of work around the edges and, and, and not necessarily get the opportunity to have a crack at all the big issues um, that really exist. And of course, build the infrastructure that we know that really makes change. But, but this um, opportunity gave a real open door for the borough to think again, start again. And as I say, kind of almost start from a blank plan. And that's really not so easy to do I think always when you're internal when you've got the baggage of, of what happened last time you engaged and people moaning and you know you can't do that or you think you can't do that because the shops will kick off and all that stuff and it's actually reasonably easy for some bright sparks such as myself to come in and start telling people they're doing things wrong and you know we can do things differently but fundamentally you know the the, the ingrained kind of nature of, of Waltham Forest being um, having to work quite hard in terms of movement for, for motor vehicles on it on its road network Lots of people from Essex um, and, and sort of the northeast of London have traditionally sort of travelled through the borough. The North Circular runs through it. The A12 runs through the borough and the local road network was kind of plagued with, with lots of traffic. And just to illustrate that, I mean, in, in a slightly different way, Frederick Bremer at the top there, who I've been invented on the first internal combustion engine cars in this country. His cars in the museum and uh, in Waltham Forest and there's a school named after him and lots of other stuff. John Kemp Starley, the bottom left there, is arguably the 
advent of the modern safety bicycle. That's the Rover bicycle that he disappeared off to Coventry and went to live with his uncle and developed the Rover bicycle that became Rover motorcycles, that became Rover cars. In Polish, bicycle is Rover. That is the Dutch bike, really, that you're looking at. Um, in the middle there at the bottom is sort of your average male commuter who, you know, lots of people think that cycling is about in London. Of course, it's not. It's the former mayor. Um, and in the bottom right is actually my children who really we were designing or trying to design streets differently for at the time. Um, and again, uh, the real focus of, of what we do often on streets should be those two people, not my kids per se, but they think about how you accommodate those people cycling and not necessarily those other gentlemen in the different images. Um, I'd say again more reasons why um, for Waltham Forest it, basically what we we're trying to do is develop a network and, and places that enable people um, to walk cycle it and almost it be a no-brainer um, they are photos of, of different places in the borough when we were kind of starting as you can see lots of traffic lots of vans um, and an early adopter of a cargo bike on the right hand side with their son taking some rubble to the to the recycling tip that I saw one day stood outside the office um, but what really, you know, is that it made it gave us an opportunity to really change streets and places and not just think about movement, actually think about the place in which people live and the, and the issues and the opportunities, um, which is something I feel really strongly about. A real example, I suppose, of, of where we were at the time was the entire borough was a designated an air quality management area. When we asked kind of what that meant and how that influenced policy, nobody really knew. They knew it was an issue and knew it was a problem and knew we needed to do something about it. But what did we do? Uh, people didn't quite know. So I won't focus on the routes here too much, but basically the idea, as I said earlier, was that, that you know, the exam question asked for a network of routes that didn't give up at the difficult places. It, it joined the town centres and, and the main town centre with other parts of the borough and then thought about uh, expanding further afield. And that light blue line that kind of goes through the bottom third of the borough there is actually Leibridge Road, and that's now known as Cycleway 23. And, and Paul actually worked on extending that into Hackney before he left TfL, and it's now a real flagship cycle route. Um, in London. The villages, which is kind of what we're more interested in today, were what we called low traffic neighbours or what I called low traffic neighbours at the time. Walthamstow Village did exist, um, but Markhouse Village, Black Horse Village, etc. didn't. And what was really interesting, I suppose, uh, or what may be interesting for you is I called them villages because the village existed. And actually, London is just a collection of villages that have been swallowed up by a city over time. And what we wanted to try and do is start getting people to think more about the fact they live in this little village that is kind of plagued by people driving through it, basically. Um, the, the the kind of aims of the project as such were there, a cycling and walking grid of, of less than 400 metres. Um, and again, by the easiest way to do that is to get rid of traffic. Um, local network that is protected from traffic conditions on main roads, wayfinding, and then direct access into the cycle network, and actually some complementary stuff too. The town centres in the borough were kind of delivered, or the idea of delivering them on a similar kind of vein. How do we go about doing that? So there was a design process, and I'd actually written a plan uh, and a concept idea that secured £27, £28 million pounds worth of funding. Um, but actually, that's all very well. That's my idea. I live in the borough, but that's kind of my view of, of what I thought was needed. And whilst it was a good template to start from, we needed to go back through the process and, and, and speak to people, and make sure that the project's for them. So as you can see, it looks um, quite complicated, this bit's not really. It's it's the fact that there you've got the movement proposals running along the top there. And obviously, we've got an idea about what we want to do street to streets and places, the placemaking part and how that integrates with, with the movement um, proposals. And that's, again, about making spaces and places once you've got rid of um, the things that get in the way, i.e. motor vehicles in most instances. And then at the bottom there, the community involvement part. And again, as I say, that's really, really important that when you're doing these sort of schemes that, that people don't feel like it's being done to them. And actually, even more important is when you go through project stages and, and the angry business who all of a sudden decides they do want to get involved, wants to have a chat about putting a bench outside their shop or whatever, it's not a good idea to say, I'm really sorry we've gone through the design flows now, mate, you'll have to wait. Um, you want to try and have a flexible, whilst you've got to have a process that delivers the project, you've got to be able to be free and, and fundamentally accommodate people as and when they want to get involved. Supporting documentation is also very important. Of course, you're going on a journey and, and trying to go in a very, very different direction, or most people in most instances are where they try these schemes. So just to show you some of the things that we got together, um, did a design guide that I wrote for the BOA, the 2020 vision similarly put together that kind of showed where we were going and where we hoped and, and that Mini Holland wasn't the beginning or the end of the, of the journey. Um, it was it was part of it. 
really important again if you're going to get these things on the ground that you take the project team with you and 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 by project team i mean all those people and of course when you're to a local authority the most important people are your residents and your businesses and and, and people who you know work and study in in the place that you're working but actually to get a scheme on the ground in london it involves all those people and more and that the strongest possible project you put on the ground is is when you involve as many of those people as you possibly can in order to do that we developed a process that lent quite heavily on what we've done i've done previously in lambeth but we but we kind of moved it on and more for us again we were all of a sudden engaging with a lot of people and asking a lot of uh questions but but basically sort of key stages early engagement resident meetings and what we call a perception survey so that's effectively again a, similar to that postcard going out and getting people to scribble on maps and and just telling you where that you know where people have a wee on the way home from the pub and places they feel is too dark and where there's dog poo and all that as much as where they'd like flowers and, and all that stuff because you actually tend to find those places are the same um design workshops for residents and businesses what's really important is that that, that you get the right information to have those conversations and, and, and inform those conversations with you and so on the top right there um you can see the top four things that businesses think people want on leverage road and then the top four things that visitors think will improve leverage road two distinctly different surveys presented to both groups of people once you've done it. Of course, the businesses think people want more car parking, better located car parking, uh, better crossings and rather ironically less traffic. The top four things that visitors want are better crossings, less traffic, protected cycle lanes and pedestrian signage. Again, businesses will get angry about what they think people want, but of course, sometimes you can help people understand by showing them actually what people who shop in their shops actually say they want. Again, the reporting process and then the statutory consultation phase, I'm sure you will know, kind of is, is, is that sort of more legal uh, stage. And again, gives people an opportunity to feed into the process if they so wish. Um, so the villages, as I say, with these distinct urban, or what, how we describe distinct urban villages, their own identities and quiet traffic free areas, 20 mile an hour, new public spaces, et cetera, et cetera. That's actually pretty much a slide that I used to show all those years ago to get them 10 years ago now to people. and people just that's Orford Road in Waltham in Walthamstow Village on the top um, and that's just a random street in, in Amsterdam that we used to show people we kind of want to go from there to there and people used to jump up at that stage and shout and call us idiots and all the rest of it of course um, but what was really important with the villages is these local connections so whilst it's that you know it, Walthamstow Village is just a bit of London actually what's really important for people who live in the villages is, is how they get to and they're just some of the local destinations the church the mosque the shops uh, the market nearby, the old historic centre, and actually um, getting towards Whips Cross and, and out in, onto Wanstead Flats for for, uh, for having a walk. Um, and of course, what we should be thinking about is how people do those short journeys, ideally by active modes, if if, if we want to do what um, I assume most people who are on the call want to do, and, and, and then more importantly, enable people to be able to do. And the, the big thing that got in the way there at the time was traffic. Again, those coloured in roads <clears throat> on, on the slide there, um, show you it's basically framed by main roads um, and barriers. So what did we do? We trialled the scheme. Um, again, as I'm sure people know, we we went through or may know, we went through a process of basically putting the scheme down, similarly to some of the COVID temporary schemes, um, put the filters in. We closed the north-south rat runs, east-west rat runs through Walthamstow Village um, and let people have a look. And of course, some people got very, very pleased. Uh, there's um, Matt Winfield saying, "Welcome for us, Mini Holland. I think I love you, Mini Holland." Other people um, were less happy. We had TV from all over the world come. We had people stand there having an ice cream, saying how much they hated it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, if you ask people what the reaction was, or you, you know, you ask the that's the reaction. So it's, again, people might have seen some of these photos as the councillor Clyde Lopes in the top left there being shouted at by a lady with photo of the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain on her on a banner, thank you, Mini Holland, for blocking me. And always very loaded language, I'm sure, again, people may well have experienced it in, uh, in their neck of the woods. Um, there's a, the famous coffin being marched down the pedestrianised street, which, of course, they would have lost about 30 seconds previously before a van beeps them or ran them over before we closed the street. But anyway, um, and there was a threat by, well, not more than a threat, uh, by uh, Dr Nazir Ahmed to go on hunger strike if we did take the scheme out. Um, I assume he stopped. Um, but actually, what's the reaction been? The reality is, of course, you hear all that shouty shouty, but this is more actually the real reality of the reaction on the ground. People campaigning to get their, their area finished, people saying, 
uh, Time Out magazine saying it's one of the best parts of London to hang out, the Aubrey Road outdoor gallery that actually is on the back of, of, of people's houses in an area where people used to wee, as I said earlier. Um, and there's my favourite one in the bottom left there with kids. We haven't even finished that filter and they dragged their tent out of their house and reclaimed that bit of the street for themselves. And, and again, that just shows you when you enable people to do that. It's not always about cycling and moving and walking. It's sometimes just about living. And actually, more often than not, it's about living. Um, as I said, I won't dwell too much on the engagement stuff, but but we you know we went hard on it. We used commonplace as a way for people to dump all their ideas and, and agree and disagree with each other and have that kind of um, continual conversation, basically, which is a real theme of what I believe works. And, and, and so our projects, we quite often think of engagement being a stage. I was talking about this the other day in, in Birmingham. It's, engagement isn't a stage of a project. A project is the stage of the engagement when you look at active travel. And that's how we have to try and think slightly differently about what we're doing, because a scheme is just a scheme. It might be the only opportunity you speak to that business. It might be the vital opportunity you can say, have you heard about cargo bikes? Do you want to give one a go? Do you know there's, you know, um, I don't know, pedestrian training available? Would you like to, to think about a park? All that stuff. They're your opportunities to talk about people. And actually what projects should be is a continual conversation with the communities you deliver. Ideas and issues coming in, information and inspiration going out, preferences, decisions, regularly updating people, cooperating, refining projects, and then handing over to the community for them to, to, to own um, and, and take forward. If you do it right, the outcomes can kind of look a bit like this. So um, there's some actually some a before and after at the bottom there. Um, there's a lady walking across very um, across a, a street, a continuous footway in front of that vehicle, which of course is changing um, behavior through design. There's Orford Road as it was, and there's Orford Road kind of now. There's one of the rat runs at the bottom of those slides um now closed phil jones's head i don't know some of you might know phil jones from pga um he helped me a bit with some of the design stuff at the beginning that's leverage road that's heading towards hackney there's some more nice places we've created um and there's another um francis road at the bottom there which is a bit like orford road a similar kind of principle pedestrianized shopping street if you do it right people join you there's the complementary measures kind of stuff cycle hangers cycle hubs, cargo bike delivery services, parents borrowing cargo bikes to take kids to school. It goes on, Leighton Orient Football Club doing cycle training with us, um, various other stuff. The progress in Waltham Forest is insane. I mean, it's, that's probably out of date now. Um, basically, I mean, it, it, as an out of London borough, it's performing like an in, the, in a London borough when it comes to active travel. People who live in, in the LTN areas do about 45 minutes more active uh, movement a week than other people um air quality i mean that's a map of, of again it's modeled air quality but that's how it looked before we started and, and on the right hand side is houses affected by uh illegal eu as it was then um nox levels so not bad um more outcomes again i know you're going to get these slides shared i'm just a bit wary of time um so yeah so i'll just jump on very quickly to liberal neighbors which was kind of the next the iteration after the mini hollands it, it almost renamed i think again paul might know better than i but i think the, the mini holland name had a cycling connotations and livable neighborhood sounded a bit nicer it was a very similar competition um lambeth funnily enough asked me to go back and help them write a bid um which i did for 10 million pounds for what was known as brixton livable neighborhood um similar principles basically area-based, low traffic neighbourhood schemes, looking at trying to get routes in actually and protect active travel routes that weren't possible on the main road network, primarily because the importance of the main road network to buses and making sure that we get that balance right. Um, so the the alternative answer was to basically do quiet routes, as Paul again touched on earlier, but do them properly um, with all due respect. And that meant getting rid of the traffic and filtering it out and, and providing those routes to people instead. So the relative livable neighbourhood, which kind of uh, extends from Brixton down towards Hearn Hill, uh, it used to be, it's based around Relton Road, that was a rat run of about eight or nine thousand vehicles a day. By cloning it and prioritising it for buses and people, we basically kind of were able to completely transform the area. Um, we got funding and then a national disaster happened. And then COVID came along. And effectively, as I'm sure you may know, Politics was played out, TfL funding was stopped, um, and basically work as, as, as such pivoted to temporary schemes and, and trying to put down what we could 
um, using temporary materials and the like. Lambeth rather cleverly used our plan that we put together as a template for their first three traffic lo uh, low traffic neighbourhoods that it got COVID funding for. Um, they basically put trees and pots down and similar to lots of other people and then engage while it's on the ground uh, using the experimental uh, order process, which of course can be down for 12 to 18 months. The idea being that you keep it and keep it on the ground and turn it into a permanent scheme if it's working. They use, as I say, that opportunity to engage in a similar fashion to we did in Wolf and Bryce. And of course, as is always the way, the usual suspects turned up. There was lots of arguing, and, and rightfully so, because again, change. People want progress, they don't want change. You know, the old adages, and particularly during COVID, of course, that was um, quite a rocky road for some people. And so it, there, there was, you know, people who were quite rightfully put out by it all. And, and the council actually did a brilliant job engaging with people, contrary to what people may hear or see or think, because, of course, you don't hear about all the good stuff necessarily. People don't tend to shout about the fact they're having a really nice time. They shout about the fact they're not enjoying it. But again, not to, you know, labour the point, but there, you know, when the parklets went in on Relton Road, people were hanging out, spending time in a socially distanced fashion. Kids added marble runs to things. People took over the planting and all, all the great things that happen when you let people get involved. Um, that's matured a bit now. You know, they've gone past that. I think Lambeth now has seven LTNs. Um, three of those are the, the those that we were just talking about. Um, the healthy roots have been embedded and protected in that programme. And basically, they're developing it as we speak. Um, early outcomes, and these are, again have probably gone on further than this, but car traffic down uh, by a third, HGVs down by a quarter, cycling up by a similar amount um, across the area and within LTNs, cycling has effectively doubled. Um, what happens next? Well, Lambeth are current, currently making them permanent. They're going through and they're rolling out. And again, other places are learning from them, I think it's fair to say, um, and developing their own networks too. And just to show you, that is uh, Orford Road uh, the other day when I rode up on my cargo bike. And of course, that is a completely staged photo, as I'm sure everyone will know, because of course, none of that sort of stuff happens. But there is zero emission delivery service uh, that was born out of our earlier complimentary measures stuff, delivering to the spa. There's people enjoying that space. Um, and I hope that's been a good uh, walk through. I will finish there. Thank you very much. John, just while I switch back to my presentation, worth saying with with um with that last image you showed that uh uh most of those frontages are 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 shops, they're full, uh, which isn't necessarily yeah. the case of high streets across across London and, and the UK at the moment. But it, I, I, you know, I, I think when I went through there recently, there must have been maybe one shop of the of the whole stretch that was vacant at the time. I think the spa yeah. was there at the start and remains there. So it's yeah, that's that's another positive. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. All right. So just to finish. John, can you see that? Just let me know. Yeah, I'll go pop. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. So, so just to finish on on some of the points John made on, uh, around the LTN, um, Transport for London recently released a study um, lo uh, looking at LTNs, uh, basically a big summary of evidence from lots of monitoring uh, they did, and that's that's the link there that that'll be uh, um, perhaps of interest to, to to the people on the call today. Um, lots and lots of findings. Uh, a lot of these findings are in line with. with that John has just made, um, that, that streets are down, streets are safer, people are um, using active travel as a means of travel more than they would before. No adverse impact on emergency services is a big one because that's obviously, you know, that's usually gets spoken about from, from the naysayers at the start. Um, and in and in general, the, the, the you know the support from the public is, uh, I mean, in this example, it's fifty eight percent, which you know, which is great to see. So um, findings in here. Um, one of my biggest takeaways from LTNs is, um, I, I think, um, and as John alluded to with, with the mini Hollands term that used to be uh, used, is that people think it's all about cycling when, the, you know, the biggest bang for your buck is walking here. Most journeys walk, um, and so if we can make walking attractive, then more people are likely to walk than, you know, than reaching for the car keys. Um, Complementary measures are key as well. John talked about a lot of complementary measures there that, you know, things that Leighton Orient Football Club were doing and cargo bikes and uh, and cycle hubs and things uh, th things of that nature. Don't forget about things like drop curbs and signage. You know, if you want people to walk, we we need to make the uh, the offering for walking attractive and things like drop curbs are, are you know, are a big part of that, for, you know, for obviously people who have mobility issues, who, uh, who are pushing uh, buggies and push chairs, uh, you know, or maybe wheelchairs, Dr uh, drop curbs make a huge difference. So we, you know, must the, the, the physical measures we need to do in in you know in addition to all those uh, uh, um, um, other points that John John made earlier. Um, this is my favourite LTN in London. 
and I'm not sure how many people have a favorite LTM, but this is certainly mine. And the reason this is mine is this is uh, one of uh, one of my last projects I worked on was Cycleway 23 on Lee Bridge Road that, that again John mentioned. This is at the western end of the scheme, uh, and indeed as far as Cycleway 23 goes at the minute. And this is an LTM uh, on the junction of Kenning Hall Road and Powell Road, as indicated in the image on the left. Now this was put in by Lambeth during COVID. Um, so when COVID hit, we'd been designing the scheme to connect into the, you know, the, the wonderful scheme in the photos that John showed. And as part of this, we were going to re uh, remodel this junction uh, into uh, a, uh, a cyclist only junction, uh, but it was going to be signalised to get across Kenning Hall Road, which was typically a very busy road that led to Leebridge Roundabout that is a hugely busy roundabout in London um, and leads on to Leebridge Road and leads uh, in uh, north, south on, on upper and lower Clapton Road. What we found pre-LTN, you know, significant flows of 11,000 plus vehicles a day. Once they put the LTN, the flows on what was a particularly busy uh, east-west arterial road from the roundabout uh, heading heading west, um, but two-way flows dropped massively to just over 3,000. And it got to the point where we'd be on site doing site visits and, you know, looking at locations for ducting and, and uh, you know, uh, signal positions, and we didn't feel the need for it at all. So this led to the whole junction being descoped um, just just on the back of the LTN being put in. So, you know, LTNs are typically a, a quite cheap intervention. This one, as you can see here, is done, done with some planters, some lining, um, haven't resurfaced the carriageway. Uh, they got CCTV on the on the lamp, uh, lamp column opposite. Um, so it's a fairly cheap way to do it. And that saving led to a saving for the project in descoping that junction that probably saved around 300K. Um, uh, and and just as importantly, I think, because we didn't put the junction in, we, we, we felt we were going to create a problem with cyclists jumping red lights um, because there was, you know, they'd essentially be waiting for no reason if there's if there no traffic going east west. So it was, I, I, I think, a really good win for, for my project as well as for the, uh, the LTN in general. Moving away from LTNs, I'm going to pick, pick up the London story with Cycle Super Highways Part 2. Um, so we, we referenced the, the the blue paint that went in as, as, as Part 1. Um, but whilst John was busy working on LTNs, we were working on segregated uh, cycle superhighways, as they were then called. TfL had four flagship routes that was designed to get uh, cyclists away from traffic and into their own uh, segregated lane, typically bi-directional. Um, the photo on the right, I think is the maybe the fourth time that that gentleman's appeared in the photo, uh, was taken on the uh, one of the four flagship routes that went over Vauxhall Bridge. Um, an indication that even people who who are cycling, who, who are using the new facilities, aren't always happy with uh, with well with with our then incumbent mayor. Uh, so I'm going to compare two two of the the routes. One one east west on the left was was one of those flagship routes, and the one on the right, CS4, was one one that we developed uh, as part of a latter stage of the of the segregated builds. Um, but we took we you know we're talking bigger routes, talking uh, 10.5 kilometres from. East West, which stretched right across the middle of London from Tower Hill in the east, all the way down Victoria Embankment to, to, um, to Parliament Square and Big Ben, all the way past Buckingham Palace and, and the Royal Parks, all the way up to the Lancaster Gate in the west. Uh, and Cycleway 4, uh, um, a kind of like a, a southeast arterial route into London, stretching through different boroughs uh, and, and significant budget as well. Uh, so these are some photos, uh, some some before and after photos of East West. So working on those uh, red route roads that I mentioned earlier, uh, where we can reallocate space away to to cyclists. Um, one of the important thing here is is over arterial roads, and people in general are familiar with arterial roads. They you know they offer you know from point A to point B fairly quickly, and by repurposing typically one traffic lane or two traffic lanes, um, playing with the widths, ensuring we had we had sufficient segregation that, that people had sufficient levels of comfort, then we could, uh, you know, we could encourage people to uh, to transfer away from other methods of, of transport and onto, um, on, onto bikes. Uh, on the left is Victoria Bankment. So again, similar to some of the images John showed, very, you know, very traffic. Um, on the right is Blackfriars Junction. Again, traffic heavy, you know, given the nature of, of, of you know, of where it is. Um, and, uh, as part of putting in these measures, urban realm improves. Uh, not just commuter cyclists, we get, you know, we get lots of, you know, lots of leisure cyclists, particularly using Victoria Embankment. People who have been to Parliament Square who might be heading up to, to you know, to Buckingham Palace or to, or, um, or, or to the Tower of London as, you know, maybe next points of call. We've created a nice alternative way for, for them to travel around London. Here's some feedback. Um, 
Durante Highwayman is a, is a prolific uh, reviewer of active travel infrastructure, particularly in London. Uh, so it's great to get some feedback uh, to the nature you see on the left. Uh, what, what I like about these and, and what was really noticeable on, on the day of opening is that we had people cycling through central London with, uh, with you know, with young children. Um, and really, really encouraging to see because, you, you know, there's very, very little chance that, you know, before these schemes were built, that you'd be able to ride as a family with, with young children through, you know, right through the heart of London. Moving on to Cycleway 4, yes, yeah, a slightly different dynamic in that it was uh, rather than go through the middle of London, this went from centre London, from uh, from the London Bridge area, heading out towards uh, the south east in Greenwich. Um, but, you know, similar uh, process to what we did with, with the East West route in that, you know, we... We, we had designed routes that, that were working and we're encouraging people to travel. And so, and so we, you know, we followed similar. So here we have, you know, again, three meter uh, segregated lanes, uh, bus stop bypasses where, where required use of different materials um, uh, for, for segregation, but, you know, ensuring we've got good, good quality services for people to cycle on, cycle on. Uh, signalised junctions where they need to cross, you know, cross major junctions or we needed to transfer the, uh, the seg segregation from one side the road to the other um and on we go with a similar premise to east west again good progress uh sorry good good feedback and again the ranty highwayman uh one of the favorite comments we've got here cycleway four is boring and that's a wonderful thing which i, I thought um uh <laughs> something what we're trying to do with with active travel measures such as this accordingly uh, a quick note to say things don't always go smoothly. East West went over budget, which was, a, I guess, a, a good learning point for when we we did Cycleway for the uh, the next time and we were able to to reclassify budgets. But yeah, East West went significantly over budget. It had a negative cost benefit ratio in the first place, but TfL decided to proceed anyway. Uh, and I think looking at the you know the numbers now uh, and how um, essential it's become to a, as a form of travel in London, it's it, you know it's it's certainly been worth it regardless. Uh, COVID-19 response schemes. I won't touch on these too much because I understand from Paul Mugato at the NTA, this is something that Ireland does quite well. Um, but uh, as John touched on earlier, um, you know, we, we we had a mandate to introduce all these schemes to get people walking and cycling. We were looking for low cost, fast installation, essentially quick wins. So lots of simple measures uh, using temporary curbs, using using wands uh, and, and using yeah uh, measures that didn't require a lot of money given TfL's perilous financial situation. Uh, minimal works to you know to, to 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 take road space away from general traffic and over to cyclists. Um, interesting to note, we didn't we didn't do public consultation on these, given it was during COVID, so that was potentially an issue we we had to address at a later date. Uh, and using a scheme called Mansell Street as an example, which was a, a link between Cycleway Two and Cycleway Three. This was one. This was probably the, the later part of COVID. Um, but a scheme a scheme had been worked up to link the two schemes, but we wanted to keep with. The, uh, the the you know the premise of what we've done for COVID because because mo money was still really tight at TfL we were we were reliant on 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 government funding we had next to no revenue due to the way travel patterns had changed and so we needed a lower cost faster installation hybrid type scheme to get this scheme on the ground um, so we designed it up using you know using similar measures that we've done to within COVID uh, but we um, as per the you know the few points at the bottom of your screen there we had some junction works we had some utilities works um, and we had the reuse of materials where possible um, but yeah uh, slightly more complicated scheme than we have for the first schemes utilities works this is one of the junction realignments we did so um, yeah this this so hybrid approach to to delivery was was taken in terms of low cost materials where we could low cost intervention where we could but if we needed to divert utilities to to realign some curbs then and, and it was necessary then that's what we had to do uh and what you see here through the photos uh is you know this was a proper construction scheme this you know this followed cdm uh, and this you know uh, followed health and safety regs and we we you know we, despite changing some of the materials to those rubber curbs to the sma infill we we you know we we still delivered what we um right i think was a proper cycling scheme um you know we had we had uh, use of segregation curves where required split curves where, where you know where we need an islands and uh, you know and all those utility works that we saw uh in in the earlier slide a couple of before and after shots you know again we were fortunate that we had a lane you know a lane of traffic that we could play with um that we could take out and we could give that to cyclists for for, for you know for a for, with two-way travel um, but low cost intervention where possible, you know, reduce the program, reduce the cost um, and made this a viable scheme um, for, for TfL.
sustainability i mentioned the reuse of curbs this is something that, that i was quite keen of as you know a, a, as part of my schemes at tfl but you know if we can use materials let's not send them to you know to the crusher or to be used as type one let you know let's see if we can reuse those granite and things like that and, and this is a scheme here uh we didn't didn't save that many curbs but we worked out the carbon savings you know would be enough to drive a drive a diesel car to to roam and back so you know and every little helps them you know in terms of you know the message of what active travel is doing and uh, you know and the carbon saving uh we we've tried to do it with materials as well a couple of last slides just to say monitoring uh, really really important that you get the monitoring right so certainly you know monitoring traffic levels before and after linking them to any benefits realizations pieces you have these are the things you can celebrate with these with you know with these schemes uh, but if you don't do your monitoring it makes it really hard to celebrate because no one's really interested in you know if the scheme went under budget over budget etc but they you know what they are interested in is you know is is the amount of people using the scheme before and after uh, and and that's and that's really the way that you know tfl has been quite good at selling the message um i've put the stats up there again of the you know of my favorite ltn um but to look at the right hand side of the scheme uh Slide. These, these these are some of the methods of monitoring that I you know that we uh make, you know maybe more innovative or, or or coming to the table now but um we use cycle counters on east west uh and the cycle counters were so popular that they, they have their own twitter account now that is nothing to do with tfl um but you know people take it on themselves to you know to produce graphs and and you know and to, and to monitor how popular these schemes are and just you know just reinforce the message that 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 they, you know, they want them here to stay and they want more of them. Strava Metro uh, is a company I've been doing a piece of work with with HS2 recently, but Strava essentially are making their data free to local authorities. So you can, you know, that can help with planning, that can you, you help with your, you know, your before numbers if you put in a scheme in. Uh, and you can obviously, you know, using, you know, people's data who, who record their journeys uh, to, you know, to show the difference before and after. But post pandemic, uh, so in London and in, you know, in TFL's world, they continue to roll out segregated cycleways. The image on the right being a picture of cycleway 23 uh, extension that is in progress at the minute. There's a continued use of temporary materials of some scheme as well. Uh, and there's a, um, uh, yeah, so there's uh, a mix of the, you know, permanent schemes rolling out and, and you know, what you might consider co uh, COVID schemes can, you know, continue to prove popular um, as, you know, as budgets and road widths and all the different considerations allow. London boroughs continue to install in, uh, LTNs, as you know, as John mentioned with Lambeth. Uh, but it's also worth pointing out that some boroughs are taking them out. So uh, mentioned London, is, you know, is, is very political, and, and Tower Hamlets, uh, uh, their their current mayor, uh, was elected on a on a mandate of removing LTNs, and that's exactly what he's doing, which is which is very disappointing for for, for people like John and I to hear. Uh, and look, yeah, lots of other little measures going on, like like Lambeth and their and their curbs are loading strategies, and lots of others I I haven't mentioned. So. Uh, what happens next? We'll, we'll wait to find out. Uh, we'll wait to see kind of the, you know, the mayor's transport strategy and what happens next after, after this late, latest rounds. But uh, uh, obviously from the perspective of people like me and John, that we hope that, um, uh, hope it continues. Um, and that concludes our presentation today. So thank you for bearing with us.